and welcome to One Spark Stories, the podcast where innovators, creators, and some unsuspecting risk takers share about navigating highs and lows, laughter and tears, and how sometimes all it takes is one spark of inspiration to find your way to happiness. This podcast will leave you inspired to take action on your own purpose as we connect create and celebrate unique sparks around the globe once again proving that it is a small world after all i am your host katie kearns and today i am so grateful to have a woman that knows just how to manage like a mother and in the most magical way valerie cockrell was a leader in retail and merchandising throughout the disney company as well as working with the disney institute She is now partner at Cockrell Consulting with her husband and previous guest, Dan Cockrell. While her story may have started in France, let me tell you, it has unfolded around the globe, including now as they go out to do training, facilitating, and consulting around leadership and customer service. Now, I first met Valerie earlier this year and was completely drawn in to her confident and humble energy. The more we interacted, the more I knew I had to get to know her. She is witty and wise and exactly the kind of woman that you want as a champion in the workplace. During our conversation today, she shares about a big project that she's been working on that is going to be so valuable to all those that are trying to navigate life as a working mom. And if you're not a mom, don't worry. The lessons are certainly enough to bring value to you as well. So without further rambling about how I may have just found a new favorite cockerel, now we don't need to let Lee or Dan know, I am going to let you decide for yourself. Well, welcome Valerie Cockerel. How are you doing today? I am doing fantastic. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited about your po- being on your podcast. So um, it's early morning here. Uh, we're currently in Brazil uh, traveling quite a bit this year, but I'm, I'm so glad I could catch you, uh, on, uh, this morning. So, um, ask me any questions, anything you want. I'm ready for you. That's excellent. And I'm glad I was able to find you while you were on land, because if you've not been on land this year, you've been out to sea. That's where I was so grateful to first meet you. And you've had quite the nomad life this past year, maybe since leaving Disney. That's going to be definitely fun to explore. So thank you so much. I want to jump in first by learning a little bit more about Valerie all the way back to when you were a kid. Because I think who we are now is a lot of times reflected in who we once were. And so as a kid, were you that creative explorer? Did you, you know, what was that thing that really got you excited as a child and curious? Well, you know, as I'm sure listeners will quickly figure out by the sound of my accent, I was born and raised in France, in Lyon, southeast of France. And I had a pretty, um, you know, normal childhood um, uh, kind of, a, a, you know, school, going away on the weekends with my parents. I have one sister. So um, nothing, you know, uh, uncommon in terms of my education. However, uh, I've always been a curious child, the one who would just, you know, ask a lot of questions, want to go to different places, like to explore, kind of disappear, come back home too late, get in trouble because of that. Um, and um, if you had asked me, you know, I was probably eight, 10 years old, what do you want to do when you grow up? I want to be a flight attendant. And not that I desired to be on the plane. I had no pl- passion for flying, but I knew that there was this huge world out there that I was really curious about. And I figured out that, you know, one way to be able to discover the world was to be able to fly. And, and I thought, yeah, maybe I'll apply and work for Air France and to be a flight attendant. And uh, by the time I became a teenager, I realized that if I wanted to do this, I had to speak English. In my um, school, you know, my educational English, we take uh, English in France, but at the time it was uh, maybe an hour or two hours a week, something like this. So by the time I was uh, 16, I graduated graduated early. I was about 16 and a half, not quite 17. And uh, I figured I got to speak English. So instead of going to university right away, I applied to be an au pair uh, with a family in London. 
And I left and went to London. And I remember that day uh, I went by train. My my family wasn't very well off. So it was, okay, the cheapest way to get there by, by train. And I uh, got in the train with my big suitcase. And then I had to take the uh, the boat across the, the channel and uh, got to London and moved in with a family, a single mom, 26 years old. She was a singer songwriter. And which was great, which worried tremendously my parents. So like, you know, you people in the show business, they kind of, you know, they have a weird lifestyle. And and uh, but it turned out it was just perfect match. Uh, Caroline was the name and she had a three year old son. And being a singer songwriter, she was also a background singer and she did long uh, recording sessions in the studio. So she needed somebody to be at home every night with her son little boy called Terry. So I lived with her for 18 months and uh, went to, uh, there is a school annex of the University of Cambridge in London where you can take a proficiency in English. So that's, that's what I did. A year and a half there, was out, it was great. I learned a lot about myself, about life in general, and obviously I learned English. Went back to France, uh, finished my studies. I studied uh, tourism uh, in order to be a, a tour operator. Again, it was still that idea of traveling and, yeah. and going to see the world. And uh, while I was studying, one of my teachers, my English by then was, you know, um, fluent. And she said, you know, I know that Disney comes every year to Paris and they recruit people f- and give them a one year visa to go to the U.S., now, needless to say, I had never been to the U.S. I had no idea what a theme park was because this is back in the 80s and there was no such thing as a theme park in, in Europe. So, you know, again, with the same curiosity, I'm like, why not? You know, who doesn't want to go live in Florida? Uh, you know, some of my friends are like, well, it's kind of crazy. You've never been there. You don't know where you're going to live. You don't know what kind of job they're going to give you. But went to Florida and um, worked there for a year. Loved it. Uh, went to Mexico after that for a little while, learned Spanish over there, explored both Mexico and the U.S., and eventually went back home, and I started working for a bank. Don't ask me why. Some fantasy in my mind had thought I want you to be in the stock exchange. So I, I think there was a, a book that I read that had inspired me to do this. So I wanted to change career. And then one morning, uh, two years later, I got a phone call from Disney, and they said, you know, we are going to open a park in Paris next year. We would like to hire people like you who not only speak English, but you know American culture and obviously, you know, Disney. So it took me literally three seconds to say, sure, sign me up. And they said, well, you have to go back to Florida to train. I'm like, even better. When can I leave? (laughs) You know, so went to Florida and then uh, met Dan. Uh, We both trained over there for a while, dated in Florida. Uh, and for those of you that don't know, Dan is my husband also uh, worked for Disney for 26 years. And so the two of us went back to France, opened the park, eventually got married over there. He always says I'm his meal ticket because his <laughs> visa was expiring. So he had to, uh, we had to get, we had a five weeks engagement. So happened very quickly. And we stayed in France five years. Our oldest son was born in Paris and relocated to the U.S. in 97. And uh, we both continued our career in Disney. I eventually stopped working for a while. So my career initially with Disney was in retail. I managed a multiple retail location for Disney. Eventually, I um, uh, became, when we moved back to Florida, took care of assortments for retail for both Epcot and the Disney Cruise Line. Uh, so that was a great, I love that job. However, at that point, we had two kids and that involved a lot of travel. (laughs) You know, (laughs) be careful what you wish for. Sometimes you get too much of it. So when you have two young kids, it was becoming impossible. Dan was working long hours also. So I took some time off. And then a little while later, I did some consulting on the side for retail companies and a variety of things, but nothing, you know, kind of part time, I would say. And then one day I got a call from Disney Institute And um, it was funny because they had a big uh, insurance company coming from Canada, about 600 people were coming to take a class and uh, they realized that nobody, they didn't have anybody who could facilitate in French. So knowing me, knowing Dan, knowing me, they reach out, say, can you help us for the day? And then uh, six years later, I'm still working for them, helping them. Uh, I was I worked there on a contract basis, which gave me a lot of freedom and a lot of time to do what I wanted to do, especially with the kids. Um, and then in 2018, when Dan left, shortly after that, I uh, resigned uh, from my contract with Disney Institute. And then we started working together, which really was not the plan initially at all. 
Uh, but then we realized that we could complement each other. We have a different style, obviously a different voice. And, and um, we do workshops now together. I don't do speech. That's not something I care for, though I'm starting to get some requests about this. Um, so we'll see. But uh, we coach people, we train organization, and we do workshops. And we travel the world in the process. So I, you know, it always goes back to this, that idea of being a child and wanted to uh, discover the world. And we're definitely doing that this year. I think we're going to spend three months at home uh, once we total everything. So uh, we, we've, we moved to Colorado hoping to buy a house and literally we haven't had the time to even look for one. Uh, plus COVID, COVID was stuck in the middle of this. So that kind of threw a, a wrench in the whole thing, but um, but we on the road anyway, so we don't have the time to buy a house and maintain a house at this point. So this is where we are. That's fantastic, and I, I love the nonlinear career path. That journey that takes so many different directions. Because I know for myself, I grew up in a home where. Uh, my mom worked her entire career in one place. She worked a very, I mean, she worked with children's hospital and it was wonderful. And she loved it. She had that great retirement. She retired at a fairly young age in the grand scheme of things. My dad's had a very traditional path for the most part. I'm seeing more than I'm like him in many ways with all these other little side pieces, but breaking that mindset that you have one option that once you finish your education and you go into a career, that's it. It's, it's unrealistic anymore. I think we see more, we know more. And when we know more, we want to do better. We want to do things different. And I, I, I go, I want to go back to that moment at the bank because we all have that where all of a sudden we take a position and we're like, yeah, this is it. This is going to be the thing that lights me up. And you walk in and it's like, what have I done? I did that. I took a position with a company that sold green air equipment and I was going to work their hospitality vertical. It was so exciting. Travel was involved. And then I get shown my cubicle. I get told the eight to five schedule. And I thought, what have I done to myself? What have I done? So what was it that within you that you knew within that banking position, that feeling that said, you need to make a change. You, it's okay to leave here. Or what was it that was so unsettling in that? You know, it, it's funny you should ask because I've, I never thought about it. But as you you asking the question, I can remember the very moments where I thought, you know, this is not for me. And I'll tell you what it is when when you work at the bank at the beginning of the of the I was a I had a portfolio of clients, and when you would start for the first six months they would give you the portfolio that we call the Z. And the reason why we called it Z, these were the clients that the bank was hoping to get rid of mm -hmm. um, for all kinds of reasons. And the director of the bank, I think his philosophy was like, you know, if we could handle these people, then we would be a better salesperson in the future for whatever reason. I mean, there may be some truth to that. To that. And I remember uh, somebody, and I remember by name, I just won't give you the name, not that it matters much, but uh, there's a lady who had, they were in financial trouble and it was, their life was just problems after problems and just bad luck. And I really fell for them and I was really hoping to help her. And I had to request um, an authorization so we could lend them a small amount of money. We're talking maybe $5,000. I mean, it wasn't a huge amount for them to get out of trouble. Her husband didn't have a job. Her son was in a wheelchair. I mean, it was just, you know, sad. But when you wanted to extend some credit to a family like this, we had to have it approved by the director. And we had to meet with him on Monday morning and justify why we thought that was the right thing to do. And I remember meeting with the director of the bank one Monday and I explained the situation. I said, you know, we need to help these people. And he looked at me and he said, you know, Valerie, there are some people in this world, you take them by the hand, you're going to hold them and help them out of their troubles and help them rise up. But as soon as you're going to let go of the hand, they're going to go right back in it. And, and he used some, I'm using the nice version of what he said, because he had more crude words for that. And I remember walking out of that meeting thinking, this is such a cynical 
way to think about people. And keep in mind that before that, I had been working for Walt Disney World for a year, where it's all about, you know, pixie dust and happiness and all this. And I remember thinking as I left that meeting that Monday morning, thinking, I don't like this. This is not me. I can't work here. Um, you know, we always, and I, at the time, I probably could not articulate that very clearly in my head. And I, I, I can do that now. This is a matter of values. And I just was not aligned with the values of that organization. I don't know. I, I'm not sure it's the values of the, these are the values of the entire banking world. But I can only make assumption that at least, you know, for that bank, that, that was the way you, they were operating. And I could not recognize myself in that. And I thought, you know, if I have to, if that's what it takes to be successful in this bank, I'm never going to be successful. And I think I was very fortunate that I recognized that fairly quickly. And when I got the opportunity to leave for Disney, I was just ready to, sure, sign me up. You know, I'm out of here. Uh, I have met some people who have been in the job for 20 years and being miserable and not making any progress and wondering why, simply because they're not aligned with the values of, you know, whatever business they work in. And I have seen people cry when they came to that realization, you know, realizing how much time they had wasted, forcing themselves into a career that wasn't meant for them. So I think now, you know, I wish I'd known that clearly back then, but at least I was smart enough to make a decision about it and say, you know what, I, I need out of there, here. So that, that's the, you know, that's what got me out of there. And I never, not regretted my decision even a split second so yeah turned out I well think, for me exactly I think we build up this story in our head that when we walk away from a position that's not serving us well it's going to just disrupt so much in the world and in reality the moment that decision is made and you take action on it it is a release there's often those tears of joy that you did it and I, I just don't think enough people realize the value in that intentional risk. I, I mean, my story is much less classy. I went to the big bathroom stall and there was a quote on the bathroom door that was like, if you're not building your dreams, who are you, who's are you building? And I break mm -hmm. down in tears in the bathroom. Like, what am I doing here? This isn't, this isn't me. This isn't aligned with that pull, that purpose that I have. And I, I think that type of risk is what people need to really start valuing more, you know, are you working on task or are you working on purpose? And I know purpose is a big thing at Disney. So when you, mm -hmm. when you went back to the company, was it, were there moments that, um, you know, naturally there's going to be new changes, new things that within a new job, it's not always going to be happy, but were there moments that you went, they just, this, this job just fits better. You know, what were the mm -hmm. things about that role going back that just drew you in, in a way that the banking position wasn't fueling, you know, what was it that pulled you? Well, you know, first of all, when you work for Disney, you work for the number one entertainment company in the world. So there's that, <laughs> you know, yeah. you, it's, it's probably the only job where you can take people, your families and friends to your work location and, and go like, check this out. How cool is this? Right. Not many people get to do this. So they, that's definitely a big reason. Um, but I think I was fortunate to be joined Disney at a time, you know, the Euro Disney project, as it was called back then, uh, was just an incredible project. Um, the the build the park 15 miles outside Paris, much like Walt Disney World is 15 miles outside of Orlando. And, you know, suddenly you have 12,000 cast members coming from, I have to guess, maybe 30 different countries, maybe more. And most of them never set foot in a theme park. And it's an incredible project. I flew back from Florida in uh, November 91. So when I remember arriving in the where Disneyland Paris is today, and there wasn't anything around it, and there were just fields of cornfields, literally. And in the middle, there would be this castle under construction. And we had hard hats and those big boots because everything, it was rainy, there was fog, it was muddy. And, uh, but it was great. We loved every minute of it. And uh, this, there was a lot of scrambling and a lot of, you know, uh, crazy things happening. We were working long hours. I think I worked literally at least, uh, you know, six days a week uh, from November 91 
to September 92, which is when we finally, you know, kind of we could take a, a breath and after the summer craziness that uh, that the opening of the park was. And uh, it was just a great project to be in. And obviously, with a lot of opportunities, I don't think I would have become a manager uh, by the time I was uh, probably 23, 24, mm. uh, until much later, if I hadn't happened to be there, where there were obviously a lot of opportunities for vertical mobility. And uh, I found myself uh, area managers a couple of years later. So, you know, there were just a lot of things that appealed to me in the job. And then it was a happy time, happy environment. Now, by the time 93 came around, as you know, uh, the park wasn't performing the way uh, we had uh, hoped and anticipated for a variety of reasons. And uh, that was, uh, I wouldn't call it a difficult time. I mean, that's the year I got married. So I was on a whole other, I found my Disney Prince Charming. Uh, we married in Paris and it was great. And then uh, two years later, uh, we had Julian, our older son. So it, it turned out for me, it was just this dynamic environment, the joy, the happiness, people are here on vacation, you know, between dealing with people who are here for a mortgage or are here because they have uh, financial problems and dealing with people on vacation to come and see, you know, the parade and the fireworks, yeah. it was night and day. There was not a doubt in my mind that that was the place where I wanted to be. Yeah, I, that's definitely the feeling that I hear from a lot of people that have worked within the organization and even my own feeling. There's a different getting up to go to work when you know you have a bigger purpose each day. It, it makes all the difference when you know the decision you make is partly in your control. You know, you may not be able to make big financial decisions, but the experience that somebody has the moment they interact with you is, is within that control. And it's so wild to me how many companies don't over-focus on onboarding and building that customer and employee experience that um, allows everybody to connect to that bigger purpose in, in all the ways. And part of the three of the big pillars of one spark are connecting, creating, and celebrating. That are those are three things I've seen consistently what get you aligned with your purpose. And so as you talk about connecting with people around the world, when I was working the college program was when Hong Kong Disneyland was being open. And so we had all the cast there training and, and there's this global awareness that comes that opens doors you otherwise would never have seen. You know, I'm a Midwestern girl. And while I like to think I'm in a very cultural area, culturally rich area, it's not as much as we think. So as mm -hmm. I met people, it opened those eyes. Were there people along that journey for you that you would say really helped you connect with your purpose as both the leader, as the now consultant, and as a mom that helped you identify that it's okay to let that be who you are and to lead with? Mm -hmm. Well, there's um, first, there is a group of people that I have to mention because the first time I worked for Disney, um, I was part of a program that was called the fellowship program. Mm -hmm. The program does not exist anymore. They discontinued their, uh, the, the program in the early 2000, I believe. But what they did back then, uh, they would uh, re uh, recruit five people from each of the pavilions of World Showcase. So we would form a, a group of about 55 um, uh, fellowship. And we would work for Disney. The idea was for us to work in different departments of the organization. So we worked in merchandise, we worked in attraction, we worked in food and beverage, et cetera. And then um, we would only work four days a week. The fifth day was uh, educational for us. So it was about learning about um, American culture. So we would go to visit a kindergarten, a university, a jail. Uh, we went to court. We went to see how the broadcast, how the news are made. We went to a broadcasting studios. Um, they took us on a trip to Washington uh, to visit. We went to the White House. We went to the FBI. Uh, then we went to New York and the, the entire program lasted the whole year. So the idea of the program was for us to learn about Disney, learn about American culture and learn about the other 10 uh, cultures of the world showcase. So I have made, you know, we, we still in touch together. There's yeah, been, yeah. you know, over 35 years now. And we, uh, I think out of the 50, some of us, uh, probably 
35 of us are still in contact. Uh, some of them are dear friends of mine. Uh, at my wedding, my two witnesses were a good friend from Italy, a good friend from Mexico. They were both on the programs. Um, so it, it was this entire group of people. We we're all kind of same same way of looking at things and um, being open to the world and wanting to learn about each other. And uh, I think it's a pity they're not doing this anymore because it was such a great thing. And I think it bought, bought Disney a lot of loyalty. We all so loyal to the organization because of what the, the chance we had to experience this program. Uh, so that was that. Uh, now, uh, during my career, I have come across, you know, several, a lot of uh, individuals. I can think of two women um, who have been really uh, important in my, uh, in my career, primarily because they were good people, leaders, and people would give you feedback no matter what. And here's, one of the things that, uh, you know, I share sometimes is, you know, I joined Disney when we came back to Florida. My husband worked for Disney. He was, you know, initially operation manager. He became a director, eventually general manager and became a vice president. Uh, my father-in-law was also working for Disney in Florida, and he was initially in charge of resort, eventually became the um, executive uh, vice president of Walt Disney World. So when you join Walt Disney World with the last name Cockrell and the, the males of your family are working up there somewhere, uh, you know, it's a little bit daunting because you always wondering, are people telling me that I'm nice and I'm good and I'm doing a great job because my last name is Cockrell? Or are they saying this because they really mean it? And I had just a handful of women, particularly, who were good at giving me feedback. And I remember one once uh, one event, particularly when one of them said, can you stop by my office? And and she laid down the low and um, there were some cultural differences that, you know, obviously I wasn't aware of. And she would be very, you know, uh, fair, but very clear about uh, my performance. And I love that about her. Yeah. And I could not be thankful enough because I knew, you know, I'm like, okay, my last name is Cockrell, but she clearly doesn't care. She yeah. will, you know, tell me what I'm doing wrong. Yeah. And I needed this. Yeah. And I think a lot of people when maybe withholding some comments or some feedback because they were afraid, I guess, or didn't want to hurt my feelings or were afraid of that there would be consequences. I don't know for whatever reason, but that, that was one of the things I learned coming to the U.S., it was, I couldn't really get feedback. So I was really grateful when people did. And, yeah. um, you know, in retrospect, I'm, I'm really, I really, I think those ladies, I've had the opportunity to tell them how much I value them and I value their uh, honesty. So mm. I think that is such a powerful distinction between just somebody harping on you, somebody just that's mean and negative versus somebody that's truly there to make you a better person and wants to ensure that you're aware of your actions. It's so easy to bristle at feedback and think, oh my gosh, they're so rude or they just don't get all that I do. But taking time to pause and really think through it and the reason behind it can be life-changing and impactful yeah. in that way. So I've had people that I have experienced in leadership positions where we don't see eye to eye, but yet mm -hmm. when push comes to shove, our purpose is very similar. And so we work through that. And yeah. that's not one of those moments to run. That's one that we do need to lean into and uh, understand that there are differences. Mm -hmm. I love that you mentioned the cultural difference too. As much as you've gone back and forth between France and the U.S., and now you're all over the place. You've got Australia coming up. You and like, how has that been navigating different cultures? And are you still learning that? Oh, mate, Valerie, that's not going to work today. How do you work through that? Uh, oh, we learn every day. And um, I always, I, I told Dan, I said, I think uh, I'm, I'm in the process of finishing a book, but I think my next book may be about that mm. because we keep learning. Absolutely. Every time we come to a different country and we, we discover something about the culture we did not know. Now, I learned a lot when I was, you know, being French, when I moved to London. And then I learned a lot when I transferred from Disney in Paris to Walt Disney World. Um, 
several things, you know, uh, not only you learn about other cultures, but you learn about your own cultures, mm. thing, thing you take for granted. Uh, one of the things, for instance, uh, and I always mention it when we talk about recognition, Americans are great at doing recognition. There's a lot of high-fiving and, and maybe it's just a Disney thing. It's hard to tell, but in general, you know, they're very complimentary. Uh, this, they support each other, at least vocally, and, you know, great job and all of this. Also because it's a culture of success. Uh, people who have success in America are uh, highly thought of. They, you know, people look up to them. They look to the Bill Gates of the world, the people who have started from nothing and become, you know, successful uh, in their life, professionally or personal life. There's a different approach in France. And for some reason that I don't know, um, success is if somebody becomes rich and famous quickly, people tend to think, hmm, you know, what what has this person done? Did they cut corners? Did they do, you know, was that ethical? Did they not pay the tax? So, you know, is there, there is this kind of, cockroll? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So, um, you know, there's this mentality in France that's, um, uh, makes it difficult in the French culture. We don't recognize much. We don't, we don't do all this. And when I got to Walt Disney World, started working there, I was watching other leaders and how supportive they were of their team and all this high energy, you know, and I found it really difficult to do because culturally that's not something we do. So I had to devise a little system and I did not invent it. Um, I read about it somewhere, but I put coins in my pocket and I would all wear, uh, always wear a pantsuit. And I, so I would put five, five quarters in my right pocket. And those coins jiggling in my pocket would remind me to acknowledge people, thank them for, you know, little 10 seconds yeah. like, hey, Katie, thank you for your presentation yesterday was outstanding. You were well prepared and it showed. And I'm really glad you're on my team done, you know, something simple. And when I would do that, I would move one quarter from my right pocket to my left pocket. And I, the plan was that all five coins would be on my left pocket by the end of the day. So I knew I would have at least thanked or recognized five people. Now, needless to say, the first week or two, the coins were still on the right pocket. Mm -hmm. And, but little, you know, gradually I yeah. developed the habit. Uh, you know, we were talking about values earlier. This is sometimes your values are not exactly align with an organization that something's expected of you and it just doesn't come naturally. Well, sometimes you can find a way to change and educate mm -hmm. yourself and, and develop the, the behaviors and, and the habit of doing what is expected of you. So that was, you know, one of the, one of the difference I noticed between France and the U S uh, the other thing, on the other hand, along the same line, uh, giving feedback in Europe, in France, you tend to be very blunt mm -hmm. and to the point. And I remember doing a presentation for the VP of merchandise in France, and he, he said something like, well, this is never going to work. So uh, you need to go back and, uh, and start over again. And, you know, it's a bit tough. You just, you know, bite your tongue and you go, OK, fine. And you come back, you go back to square one and start over again. Uh, but that's how we do business. So at least that's how we did. I haven't worked in France for a while, but I'm pretty confident it's still the case today. Uh, so, and when I transferred over to the US, I remember I worked on the Millennium Project in, at Epcot and we redid a whole bunch of stores, among others, Mal's Gear, uh, which uh, what used to be called Centorium. We converted it from a 10,000 square feet uh, store to 22,000 feet. And it was a big project. We flew to California to meet with the WDI people for this project and then got back. And I remember presenting the Millennium Disruption Plan because, you know, unlike Disneyland Paris, when we worked on the Millennium Project, we had to renovate and rehab a lot of locations, but it had to happen overnight because the park was open during the day. And we still had to meet our budget and our revenue. So there was a lot of disruption happening. We had to set up temporary stores everywhere. And I remember presenting the plan and um, the uh, senior vice president of merchandise said, Valerie, have you thought about this? And I can't remember what this was, but, and I didn't think much of it. I answered her, but kind of, you know, I kind of dismissed him. And one of the lady I was referring to uh, earlier who was in the meeting with me realized what was happening. And, and she was always willing to give me feedback. And she told me after the meeting, she said, you know, Valerie, when the senior vice president of merchandise tells you, Valerie, have you thought about this? 
it's a, you know, you really should look into it and do it. And I was like, what, why wouldn't she say so? And, but that's the way culturally business was done uh, at Disney. And maybe the business is done in American culture in general. There's, it's a little bit more subtle than it is mm. in Europe. And if you're not ready and prepared for it, you may miss it and then get yourself in trouble. Right. Yeah. So that's another you know, example uh, of differences between France and the U.S. And obviously, since we travel around the world now, we everywhere we go, we discover something. Um, we, we're currently in Brazil and um, talking about uh, feedback, Brazilian people don't do feedback. They just mm. don't. They just you know, that they're very nice, very kind, a uh, lot of uh, empathy for others, but it's, some, it's something they find very difficult to do. So you have to, that's actually, we train them on a lot of that uh, as we spend more time here in Brazil. Uh, so yeah. it's fun. I love, to me, that's the favorite part of what we do as a job, you know, traveling the world is discovering all these little differences. So maybe that's another book in the, in the making. Oh, it absolutely is because not I, there's such a mindset around what DEI, what diversity, equity, inclusion looks like. And this right here is a great example of why it matters to have these conversations in organizations, because you may be the most well-intended leader, but you, if you aren't aware of the subtle differences that come up in the passive ask versus a very obvious, blatant, I need you to look into this, it will come off as lazy or miss. There's so much room for misunderstanding. Yeah. Even if it's somebody that comes from a small town to big city or big city to small town, it's not always a global difference. And these are the conversations that absolutely need stirred. So I'm gonna hold that to you and I'm gonna start pinging you and say, Hey, how's that book coming? How's that book? <laughs> because these, these are very important pieces. Amanda was on, she is in Australia. And when she was on the podcast, she talked about poppy syndrome and how it's the idea that if you are the tall poppy, if you stand out from the crowd and make yourself seen in a successful model, it is looked like, oh no, we need to cut the head off that one because that's not how we work. We're all here mm -hmm. to function as one. And that it's just more and more, um, the more awareness we can have to the way our different cultures yeah. function, maybe it'll ignite a little more compassion <laughs> in, the, in people because we're, we we're do need compassion area. right now. Yeah. I, I want to ask about another culture that I think you are going to be very insightful to, and that is the culture of being a working mom. As a driven mother, I was in education and I had summers and breaks and it was fabulous, but I also got to a point where I knew I needed more. It was that purpose-driven life. And people would often ask, well, aren't you going to miss these breaks? And I'm like, well, I'm going to build it a different way. And it became more about how are you going to be there for your family versus, wow, you're building this opportunity to really allow your family to go directions nobody else has seen. So could you explain that journey for you and the, the culture of being a working mom? Well, you know, as, as you know, I'm writing a, a, I finished a book about this uh, recently. It's with the publisher right now. So I think it's going to come out beginning of next year uh, in Brazil and in, uh, and in the U S um, <clears throat> you know, I'm over 50 now. So looking back at my career, I think about all the insecurities I had as a young woman, um, coming us, uh, coming up in the workforce. And whenever I stopped working or let's say when we transferred from France to the U S I had about a six months gap between the, the two jobs. It wasn't a straightforward transfer. And so every time I went out of the workforce, so every time I was given opportunity for new leadership responsibilities, it always came with a huge amount of guilt or not guilt, doubt and mm. thinking, can I do this? Um, do I really deserve this? Am I going to be good enough? Am I, can I, you know, am I, can I still make a difference? Am I still relevant? Uh, and I remember feeling that way when I went back to working for Disney, for Disney Institute, for instance. So, and I think uh, a lot of women deal with that. And there's also the guilt of, you know, my kids are home and here I am doing, you know, uh, traveling and, and working when maybe I should be with my children. So, and um, also the third thing is that as I moved up 
the ranks, um, I remember being a cast member thinking, oh, wow, to be a lead, you must be really, really good and really, really smart. And then one day I became a lead. And then I was like, well, to be a supervisor, as we called the, the guest service managers at the time, to be a uh, supervisor, you need to you know, be super bright. And, and then I became a supervisor. And then I became an area manager. And every time I went up, I was like, well, for some reason, I always thought to be a leader, you had to know everything and you had to have all the answers. And a big revelation for me was to realize that you don't have to do it all and you don't have to have all the answers. You just have to make sure things are getting done and you pull all the resources and all the skills and all the talents that are required to do the job. And for me, that was such a revelation. I'll tell you a story. When I became area manager of Festival Disney in France, which is Festival Disney is a smaller version of Disney Springs. And uh, I was so eager to prove that I could do that job that um, I was probably one of the worst manager you could think of. Uh, and we had a 360 review. And when the 360 review came back, I was so confident. I was thinking, okay, I've got this. I'm working so hard. I'm doing long hours. I'm sure this is going to be good. And the feedback came back and I was like, oh, wow, shocker. Um, but I found out that the people who worked for me thought I was micromanaging because I was getting into everything so eager to prove that I could do it all. Um, they thought that I was uh, confusing them because I had so many ideas or things I wanted to change and modify and uh, new things I wanted to sell. Oh, we're going to do cotton candy here. We're going to sell balloons and we're going to do this. We put a cart over there and and we're going to redo this merchandise location and then we're going to work with Mattel and and people were just confused, like, what is the priority? And I was, I was becoming very frustrating for my team. And then the third thing was people said I would, I would not respect their personal, uh, the balance between their personal life and professional life. And I was like, why would they say this? But the thing is, at the time, I was working probably 13, 14 hours every day. I was the first one there, the last one there. And when you don't let your team know that it's okay to go home, it never occurred to me. I was in my late twenties at the time. It never occurred to me to tell my team, "Hey, it's six o'clock. You have a family. Go home. Get your kids. Have dinner. Enjoy your evening." If you don't say that, the people who work for you are, are probably they're watching you and they think we have got to do what our boss does. Mm -hmm. You know, we have if she stays here fourteen hours every day, we have to stay fourteen hours for her to think highly of us. So, you know, it's like in office buildings when, yeah. when you have the leader has the corner office and the light is on in the corner office and nobody dares leaving the office yeah. until the leader, the light of, of the leader's office is off. And as soon as that light is off, you hear all the laptops closing down. <laughs> um, so, but it never occurred to me to tell my team it's okay to leave. And I was not expecting them to do what I did, but I never said anything to let them think of otherwise. So they thought that that was my expectation. And uh, so anyway, that feedback came back and I was like, all right, Valerie, <laughs> you, know, uh, you better change behaviors. And, you know, I, I learned all of that. Now, in retrospect, I'm thinking about all these mistakes I made. And I thought, well, maybe there is a way I can help uh, young women and young professional and mothers to avoid this mistake and to not have the the lack of confidence that they have when they get into the workforce uh, by, uh, so I just, you know, like I said, I just finished the book. It's called Manage Like a Mother because I think being a woman means uh, that you either mother or you have maternal instinct and maternal instinct makes you a great leader mm -hmm. uh, because if you think about it, everything a mother does day in, day out is what great leaders should do. They should train their people, much like you train your kids to talk, to walk, to eat. Uh, and when you do so, when you teach your kids, you give them time to learn at their own pace, right? You, when, you're, when your toddler starts walking, you hold both their hands and it's kind of, that's, that's that moment. It's the backbreaker, right? Where you got to walk around the house holding two hands and then, and then you let go of one hand and then you let go of the second hand and the child takes three steps and then crashes to the floor. Well, as a mom, what do you do? You're not going to say, what's wrong with you? You're never going to be able to walk. No, you say, hey, great job. Good try. Let's try again. And you take the hand again and start teaching, helping them walk again. 
until they can do it independently. So think about a leader, you know, you need to help people the same way. Some people will learn in a week, some people will learn in two weeks, giving them the flexibility to learn at their own pace, encouraging them through the process. Good job, good try. All right, let's try that again. And, and then, uh, um, you know, being there for them, being supportive and uh, making sure that you are, um, you, if they fail, it's okay to fail. It's not a, you know, you, you just learn from it and start over again. Uh, so that's training. And then you can think about recognition. Mm -hmm. uh, a mother is your number one fan, right? If you played sports, who's the loudest on the sideline? It's your mom, right? And then when it comes to feedback, Mothers get feedback day in, day out. They're not going to say, hey, Katie, uh, let's talk at your year end review. And when the, you know, they don't wait for the right. year end review to say, it's your birthday. You've been a bad let's girl check your this file. Year. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, you've been a bad girl this year, this week, and uh, here's what this year, and this is what's going to happen. No, moms, mm -hmm. they do it right away. And, uh, and they still love you unconditionally through all of that because mothers understand that giving feedback is not about, judging character it's about changing your behavior and leaders should do that when they give feedback right you're not judging somebody it's not about who they are it's about what they do and that's very different um and then mothers set expectation come back home by five if you're not home by five there's going to be consequences and they keep you accountable and you get in trouble and you go and get your privilege uh taken away if you don't uh follow their expectation uh, mothers don't don't even get me started on time management right uh if there was a i actually wrote in my book if there were a gold medal for uh time management mothers would win every time they, this is the dream team of time management and multitasking uh, moms yes. can do three things at once uh, they can supervise homework uh, cook dinner and think about uh the errands they gotta run the next day Mm. Uh, uh, moms are great at uh, conflict management. I have three kids. That makes me an expert in conflict <laughs> management. <Yes. laughs> right? Yep. Uh, there's there's been days where I knew what I had to do was separate them to let the emotions, you know, uh, go down a bit, and then uh, bring them back together and find some common ground so we could build on and teach them how to collaborate and work together or, or not fight about the TV remote or something like this. Um, yeah. And as a leader, you need to do this. Make sure yeah. people understand that there's common ground and you can find it with them and help them uh, work together, even if they don't always get along perfectly, but they need to work towards the same goal. Uh, crisis management. You know, when your child is sick, who comes, who steps up? The mom. Mm -hmm. They know. They, they stay, you know, cool and calm and cool and collected, you say. And um and they react and the adrenaline kicks in, but they make decisions quickly and efficiently. Mm. Leaders need to do that. Uh, so anyway, I, there's, you know, role modeling is another one. You know yeah. that you can't tell your kids, hey, don't lie. If you lie, they will catch you. They watch you. They know, and they will call you out. It's happened to me. I remember once telling my kids we were in the, the, no, the notorious minivan. You know, I was the soccer mom. And I was telling my kids, never text and drive. And the kids said, well, mm -hmm. mom, you do it sometimes. And I started saying, well, I do it when we're at the traffic light, when the light is red and we're idling at the traffic light. But I realized like, no, you lost that one, Valerie. You really messed up here. Because my, my son, the youngest, that was Tristan. He was probably seven at the time. And he was, he pointed it out right away. Mom, how yeah. do you, t you talk about not texting and driving, but then you do it. Boom. There you go. <laughs> you know? Yes. So uh, anyway, so I can go on and on, but uh, that to me it became so obvious that uh, everything a mom does naturally, instinctively prepares them for being great leaders. And yes. um, we can all get inspiration from that. Yes. And not enough moms embrace that that power, that, that influence that they have, they live in the doubt, they live in the anxiety and the chaos of shuttling from school to work, to practice. And, and, you know, even though I know I am so grateful and you've got, I've got a husband that's very involved. You've got Dan and, and we are surrounded by these men that are also so involved and provide that guidance to our kids it's just so important that women hear from other women and other moms that 
have found the balance and found the power in that chaos. So I appreciate very much that you are helping bring that to light because as much as we can be told it's okay, or as much as the men in our lives or the other business leaders that we're around say, hey, you've got it going, like you're doing a great job. There's something about hearing from another mother that's just figured out how to manage like a mother. And I, I think that's the absolute perfect title. So very excited. I'm just beyond grateful for the connecting you've done to the global perspective and all your experiences and now creating this opportunity for others to dig even deeper into that mothering side. So before okay. we wrap yeah. up, I want to make sure to celebrate you, but flip the script a bit and not me tell you what you've done so well. I want you, and this is probably going to be digging deep into that discomfort, but what is something about you that we need to celebrate? What is something about Valerie that you're like, you know what? I did a really good job at this. I know it's that prideful moment, but what is it that you're, you're really proud that you have been able to do? Well, um, I would say that curiosity thing, always, you know, wanting to go elsewhere has and, and learning about people and, and caring about people, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it served me well. And uh, in retrospect, I think that's something uh, that is something everybody should do. And we've always encouraged our kids to do the same thing. And currently we have, you know, my kids are scattered around the world, I should say. And uh, I think we've ingrained this uh, into their DNA um, because they were all curious about the world. And I'm so proud of that. I'm so proud of them for doing this. And they're very, uh, they engage in with other people of different culture. They have friends from all over the world. They love traveling. They're just curious about the world. And that I, you know, if there's one accomplishment I am proud of is having, you know, obviously having three kids as a mom, you, that's got to be your number one accomplishment. But having taught my kids that for me is really important that, you know, there is so much more out there that you need to learn about and so much value in it. You know, it's such, um, uh, it's enriching. It highlights your, your shortcomings also, which is always a good thing. So you travel and you deal with other people, you learn about, um, humility also, because you realize all the talents you don't have, the skills you have yet to acquire all the knowledge you have yet to learn. And that's when you realize that you never stop learning. I mean, like I said, today, when we travel with Dan, we steal some time and we just, it's, it's um, blows our mind to see everything that every day, it's like opening a door and then behind there's another 10 doors and I'm like, oh my yeah. gosh. And, and then you keep going this way. And so that, that would be probably my, my proudest uh, accomplishment is passing that on to my children. And, and hopefully passing that on to other people, some young people that we interact with. Today, what we do with Dan, whenever we work with organization, and this has been a model that seems to appeal to a lot of organization, we tell them, you know, if they hire us for a workshop or if they hire Dan for a speech, then we offer to do a free speech or mini workshop for a local NGO or local um, college or, or mm. school nearby. Um, and we do this on behalf of the company mm. and it's very well received uh, by the school and it's very, uh, you know, companies love it because it's good PR for them. And Dan and I, we love it. We love yeah. it. We just went recently to the Link uh, Business School here in Sao Paulo and it was their first day back to school and there was about 120 students, I believe. And we just went and talked to them for an hour and uh, there's some great question and it's and they're very to see the eagerness and the enthusiasm uh, that they have. And I'm, I'm looking at them. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I wish I was 20 again. And it's funny because I grew up hearing my mom say, I wish I was 20 and I knew what I know now. And I remember mm -hmm. rolling my eyes when my mom would say this. OK, here we go again. Mom saying the same thing over and over again. And now that I'm over 50 and I'm think I'm feeling and saying the exact same thing. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I wish I was 20. I was a student starting my life and I knew everything I know now. So uh, we love doing this. We love interacting with students. Uh, young women, young professionals who, you know, say thank you. And we, we talk uh, to them after our workshops and see what the challenges they have and knowing that you can make a little dent in it and help them and support them. 
uh, to me, that's, you know, that's mm-hmm. it. If I can do that for one person, great. Yeah. If I can do that for 10 people, even better and so on. So that's, yes. you know, that's our legacy, I guess. That's so cool. So if you could leave people with one thought, one nugget of knowledge about something that you want them to unlearn, whether it's a habit or uh, a, an assumption about that career path or about being a working mother, what is it that you wish people could just unlearn and focus on embracing that spark of opportunity? I, I think it would go back to what I just said. It's like, if you have assumptions about things, well, don't. Mm, yes. <laughs> don't have assumptions. Just go keep an open mind mm. about things. You know, ask yeah. questions, listen to people's opinion. Don't ever underestimate somebody uh because of who they are their gender their you know race their background their you know sexual orientation do not there's you know they are the people are good people they have a lot to offer not everybody offers the same thing and there is something that you can find uh that is absolutely surprising and beautiful about people their uniqueness is endless Right. Uh, They always say that don't uh, what's the thing? Uh, Be your own person. Everybody else is already taken. It always makes me think that, yeah, everybody has it's there's no playbook to people. Everybody's different and everybody's worth of learning from. So um, Mm -hmm. that that would be what I would have to say. Just don't have uh, uh, preconceived ideas about people or or prejudice because you don't know. You don't know what you don't know. That's the thing. Yes. Absolutely perfect way to summarize all of this. Valerie, thank you so much. Where can people connect with you, find you? What is the best way for them to make sure they're aware when that book does come out? Well, the book uh, should come out uh, March or April next year. Um, I'm on LinkedIn, obviously. So it's really funny. I'm, I'm really horrible at social media <laughs> and uh, never did, never got into it. And since we started tra- um, working here in Brazil, Brazil lives of social media. They just, this is, they always take pictures. I've taken more pictures. We've been here five weeks now. I've taken more pictures in five weeks than I have possibly in the entire year, if not more. Uh, because everywhere people want pictures with you and they, you know, they do selfies and uh, vamos tirar una foto. Did you hear this all the time? You know, we got to make a picture. So, um, and they've, we work here with a team. There's a young man, his name is Bruno. And he said, uh, and we do talk about Bruno here, by the way. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but he said, Valerie, you have got to do something about social media. So we uh, just started Instagram and um, he's posting a lot of things in Portuguese on both my Instagram and my LinkedIn. So if you see anything in Portuguese out there, don't be afraid. I still look at it. I'm very much involved in it, but we're posting a lot and I'm, I'm trying to, I'm, I promised him and I'm committed to, you know, updating and posting and putting more stuff. So, but I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram and I'm on LinkedIn. So that's where you can find me. And obviously Carcroll Consulting, which is the business we have with Dan. So, um, Yes. You can reach out to us. Voila, yeah. as we say in French. Voila. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for really giving us a glimpse into the woman behind the cockerels because we all know it takes a strong one to keep them together. So thank you so much. I cannot wait for more people to get to hear and learn from you, Valerie. Thanks, Katie. Thanks for having me. That was wonderful. Right, you know what to do before you even move on from this episode. Make sure you let me know how much you love this conversation with Valerie, because those ratings and reviews are what will help get the show in front of others that may be looking for that spark of inspiration. Likewise, I encourage you to share this episode with anyone that you think could use a boost of confidence around that importance of taking risks and needing a reminder of all that we can learn through adversity. Thank you again to Valerie Cockrell. And as always, be well, stay curious, and I'll see you real soon. Uh, Point of fact, uh, avocados are fruits. Later, tater.